Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight is a familiar face if you've been here before, one of the students at the Planetarium, and I will let him introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name is Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy student at UMD. So tonight, uh, we are going to be taking you all on a tour of our solar system. Uh, we're going to stop at each of the planets, visit some of the moons, uh, and just learn some cool stuff about them. Uh, now, while I get things set up, if you do have any questions throughout the show, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Eli is going to be keeping an eye on that for me, uh, and will let me know as those questions come up. Uh, and then... We'll also have time at the end of the show as well to take questions. But let's get to it. So we are tonight for the show going to be using a program called Celestia. It's a really great kind of uh, universe viewer that does particularly well for the solar system. Um, it's a really cool program. It's actually free to use. There's a link to it in the video description if you're interested in trying it out for yourself. But right now, we are kind of far away from our sun, uh, kind of viewing the solar system. And if you notice, right there at the center, our sun looks nice and bright, um, but looks pretty much like the other stars. Uh, and the planets themselves, we can't really see very well. Um, and that's just showing us how small the planets really are and also showing us kind of how big the solar system is and how spaced out they are. So a better way to see this is if I actually turn on these orbit lines so that we can now see the orbital path of the planet around the sun. And now you can see really well just kind of how far apart, especially these outer planets are. And as we get closer and closer, um, our four inner planets, which are much closer to the sun. But for our tour of the solar system, we are going to start with what lies at the very heart, the very center, and that is our sun. Uh, so our sun is a star, just like all the stars we see up at night. It's just a lot closer, so it looks a lot bigger and brighter to us. Of course, it's up during our day. Uh, now, if we look closely at the sun, we can see there are these dark spots. Those are what we call sunspots. I know, really clever name. Um, but these are basically areas that are a little bit cooler, and that's why they look a little bit darker. Now, they're not super cooled. Um, they're still incredibly hot. This is still a star we're talking about. So the average kind of surface temperature of the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The sunspots are about 7,000. So a little bit cooler, but still incredibly hot. Um, but we can also see these like loops and arches coming off of the sun. These are loops of gas uh, that are arching off of the sun and coming back down. They're what we call a solar prominence uh, or a gas arch is just a little bit better. And those are the things that can create solar flares. So what happens when that arch of gas kind of extends out, sometimes it extends out too far and it snaps, just like if you stretch a rubber band too far. And when it snaps, it flings all of that gas into space and creates that solar flare. All right, enough about our sun. Let's head on now to the closest planet to the sun, and that is Mercury. And here we are. So Mercury looks maybe like something else that you know of that we often see up in our sky. Uh, a lot of people say that it looks kind of like our moon. And there's a pretty good reason for that. Um, they are actually very similar. So Mercury is a little bit bigger than our moon. Mercury is about one third the size of the Earth. Uh, but we still see that it's this big ball of gray rock that's covered in craters. 
Uh, and what these craters tell us is that Mercury doesn't have any sort of erosion. Um, it doesn't have any sort of like volcanic activity or tectonic activity because all of that sort of thing erases craters after they're formed. And so we wouldn't see them anymore if that sort of activity was going on. And so what's basically happened is for the past four and a half billion years that Mercury has been around, which is the age of the solar system, it's just been continually hit over and over and over again. And then there's nothing to erase the, those craters, so they just stack up. And we end up with this object that is saturated in craters, just so many of them. Uh, now you can also see that some of them look a little bit lighter. Those we think are craters that are a little bit younger, a little bit newer. And that's basically exposing um, material that was under the surface that's a little bit lighter in color uh, because the material on the surface tends to darken with time. It's just a process we've noticed happens. Uh, now, since Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, it does get incredibly hot. We're talking daytime temperatures over 500 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's only in the day. At night, temperatures can plummet down to negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And that happens because Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. Atmospheres act like a blanket that trap heat. And so without that, uh, there's nothing to hold on to the heat once the nighttime side is no longer facing the sun. And so it cools off very quickly uh, and gets very, very low temperatures. So we have kind of two extremes on Mercury, right? You have very hot and very cold, depending on if you're at daytime or the nighttime. All right. Well, let's venture away from Mercury now to our next planet, and that is the planet Venus. So Venus is often sometimes called Earth's twin. And that started from kind of a while ago before we knew a lot about it, because all we really knew about Venus was it's about the same size as the Earth. It has what we think about the same composition. And we also, as we can see here, See, Venus is covered in this thick layer of clouds. And so if it has clouds and is the same size as Earth and made of the same things as Earth, then maybe it is Earth-like. Uh, the problem is we really couldn't know more than that because of these thick clouds. They block our view. And so it wasn't until the 60s when we developed radar technology that allow us to peer through those clouds and finally see what's underneath. And what we ended up seeing was something that looks like this. And um, let me tell you, not like the Earth at all. It turns out that those clouds that we were seeing, these clouds, are not clouds of water vapor like our clouds here on Earth. They are clouds of sulfuric acid. Down on the surface, because Venus's atmosphere is so thick, uh, it's about 90 times what we experience with our atmosphere. So the pressure squeezing down on you of that atmosphere above you would be 90 times what we experience here on Earth. And then on top of all that, temperatures on Venus day and night can get up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And that comes back to that really thick atmosphere. Uh, it traps a lot of heat and holds on to it and makes the temperatures skyrocket so that it is the hottest planet in our solar system, hotter even than Mercury, the closest planet. So no, it turns out Venus is not really Earth's twin. Uh, there is quite a lot of it that um, is very different and not a place that we would like to go. All right. So the third planet from the sun is the one that we know the best because that is our home planet of Earth. Looks quite a bit different than Mercury or Venus that we've seen so far. 
uh, of course, uh, first world that we have seen that has liquid surface water, first world we have seen that has life. Uh, so a lot different about our home planet. Uh, but the other thing that's different is the fact that the Earth has a moon, which, um, oops, there we go. Uh, all of the other planets that we've been to so far uh, don't have moons. Uh, Earth is the first one to have one. So our moon does look pretty similar to Mercury, as we said. It's a little bit smaller. Um, so Mercury is about one-third the size of the Earth. Our moon is about one-fourth the size of the Earth. What we still see, it's this big ball of kind of grayish rock. We have lots and lots of craters all over the place. Um, but what's a little bit different is on the moon, we have these dark patches. So these dark patches are what we call lunar maria. Uh, maria is Latin for sea, body of water. And that comes from a time before telescopes, when people looked up at the moon, saw these dark patches and thought, that kind of looks like water. So it must be. Um, now, we've since learned that that's not the case, that this is rock, but the name's stuck, and so we still call them the Lunar Maria. Uh, but if we look closely at them, we can see that the Mari look a bit smoother than the surrounding area. They don't have quite as many craters. And that actually gives us a hint as to what caused these areas. Um, these are actually ancient lava flows. Uh, so long ago, back in the beginnings of the solar system, it turns out that the moon was hot enough inside for there to be molten rock. And then it must have been hit a few times by some really big objects that cracked open the crust and created these cracks that allowed that molten material to well up to the surface, where it then flooded the surface, filled in the craters that were there, much like kind of paving over potholes. And then as it cooled and hardened and solidified, we now had this nice, new, smooth surface. Uh, and since they formed, they just haven't been hit as often, and so we don't see as many craters there. So there are a little bit younger patches of surface on the moon. All right. Well, let's make our way now. Stop turning us too much. Uh, to the next planet in our solar system. That is the red planet Mars that has been very exciting lately. Um, we just, NASA just landed their fifth rover, Perseverance, on Mars. Um, we're very excited to see what it kind of tells us. And I'm not going to say too terribly much about Mars tonight, because next week we're actually doing an entire show that's going to dive into the mysteries of Mars and kind of look at what we have learned over time some of the reasons we've been so fascinated with it, and then also kind of uh, end with the latest updates from the Perseverance rover. So I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil too much of the show for next week, uh, but if you do want to ex uh, explore Mars with us in a bit more detail, join us next week for that show. All right, now Mars has two of its own little moons. They are named Phobos and Deimos, Fear and Panic. And they are quite a bit different from uh, our moon. Uh, so we're going to kind of zoom in on a little Phobos. And I like to call these, very lovingly, lumpy space potatoes. Because to me, that's what they look like. They look like lumpy space potatoes. Uh, so these are much smaller than our moon. They are not spherical. They're kind of lumpy in shape. Uh, but they are these kind of chunks of rock. And so we actually think that Phobos and Deimos are asteroids since Mars sits right on the edge of the asteroid belt. And so it's very likely that both of these moons are a couple of asteroids that just got a little bit too close to Mars. Mars's gravity grabbed onto them and caused them to start orbiting Mars itself and become moons. Uh, and so that's where our lumpy space potato moons of Phobos and Deimos came from. 
right, moving outward even more, we are going to head out of the inner solar system, out into the outer solar system, to visit the king of the planets, uh, the largest planet of Jupiter. And Jupiter is quite a sight to see. It's a very, very beautiful planet with all of these swirls of clouds that we can see, these stripes of different colors. Uh, we can see little ovals that are actually storms, a lot like hurricanes. Uh, but the most famous feature on Mars, or not Mars, on Jupiter, is currently not visible. Um, so let me just speed time up a little bit, make Jupiter spin around. Jupiter actually spins quite quickly. It uh, makes one rotation, or what we would call a day, in a little over 10 Earth hours. Uh, so it's quite a fast spinning planet. But there we go. Uh, right up there, that big red spot is, well, exactly that. It's the great red spot. I told you, astronomers, we're not always clever when we come up with names for things. But this great red spot is a hurricane, but not really like any hurricane we've experienced here on Earth. This hurricane could fit two to three Earths inside of it. Huge storm. Not only is it so big, but it's also been raging for over 300 years years. For as long as we have been looking at Jupiter through a telescope, we have seen the storm. And we don't know why it's been able to last so long. That's one of the things we're still trying to figure out. Um, now, Jupiter, along with the other four or other three outer planets, are often given the nickname of the gas giants. And that has led a lot of people to conclude that they are made up of gas. And I hate to break your hearts, but that's actually not true. The term gas giant is a bit of a misnomer. So they are made up of things like hydrogen and helium, which we typically think of as gases. But at the temperatures and pressures of these planets, that hydrogen and helium is actually not a gas. It is at the very outer atmosphere area, but inside, it's actually a liquid. So these are better, no they, they should, sorry, um, they would be much better described as liquid giants instead of gas giants because they are predominantly liquid hydrogen. So just a little bit of, of misnomer clearing up there. All right, so surrounding Jupiter, you can see a whole lot of lines. Uh, these are the orbits of the many, many, many moons of Jupiter. Uh, current count has Jupiter at 79 moons, which is kind of insane. Now, most of these are lumpy space potatoes. Uh, so a lot like the Phobos and Deimos around Mars, captured asteroids. But Jupiter does have uh, a few but larger moons that are pretty interesting. And while we do have an entire show dedicated to moons of the solar system, uh, I do want to show you my personal favorite moon. Uh, and that is the moon Io. So Io, we nicknamed the pizza moon because, I mean, come on, it looks like pizza, right? You have that cheese and sauce and Eli, I'm not going to start the argument. So either sausage or olive, whatever you want. We're not going to get into it tonight. Um, good. Thank you. Time. <laughs> um, so uh, what's really interesting about this moon, though, is all of these dark specks that you're seeing are actually volcanoes. Io has over 150 active volcanoes. That's more than Earth, more than any other world in our solar system. It is the most volcanically active object. And that's strange because Io is actually a little bit smaller than our moon. And our moon isn't currently volcanically active. 
Uh, it hasn't been really volcanically active at all, except for those little few lava flows that formed the Maria. So how can Io be so active? Well, it turns out Jupiter over there is to blame. So Io is caught in this kind of tug of war between Jupiter and the other moons. We have Jupiter on one side pulling Io towards it, and then the other moons on the other side pulling Io the other way. And that pulling back and forth causes Io to stretch and release, stretch and release. And it's the stretching and releasing that causes the rocks inside to rub against each other. And just like you, uh, when you rub your hands together on a cold morning, uh, those rocks heat up as they rub against each other. And that creates a lot of heat. And that heat has to escape somehow. And in the case of Io, it escapes in the form of volcanoes. And so because of this giant tug of war, uh, a lot of heat is being created. And so we end up with lots and lots, I mean, hundreds of active volcanoes all over Io. So it's a cool little moon. I like this one. All right. Uh, so let's make our way to the next planet. And that is the planet Saturn. Tends to be usually the fan favorite planet at our shows. Uh, of course, it's most famous for its beautiful ring system, although it's actually not the only planet to have rings. It turns out that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have rings. It's just Jupiter's are the biggest and brightest, and so they were the only ones that we can see with a telescope from here on Earth, so they were the first discovered, and that's why Saturn is the most well-known for its rings. Now, the reason they are so bright is because they're made up of ice, and ice is very reflective, and so the sun's light bounces off of the ice and makes them shine quite bright. Uh, now, the ice within the rings are millions and millions of little pieces of ice, everywhere from the size of a grain of sand all the way up to boulders the size of a house. Um, so quite a range there in the size of these icy particles. And we actually think the big, beautiful rings that we see are not typical. We think what we're seeing is a temporary enhancement to Saturn's rings. Um, what models show and kind of what we've learned is that very likely in the past couple hundred million years, a comet actually got a little bit too close to Saturn and Saturn's gravity ripped the comet apart into millions of little icy pieces that then settled into a ring around Saturn, giving it a kind of enhanced, bigger, brighter, icier ring system than it maybe naturally has. So what we're probably seeing is not, not typical, but I gotta say it's a great time to be around and seeing it if we're kind of seeing a, a rarer uh, view of these rings. All right, um, so Saturn also has kind of these stripes of clouds like we saw in Jupiter. Uh, they're not quite as colorful, uh, they're not quite as distinct, and we think that's because the clouds actually sit a little bit lower in the atmosphere. Since Saturn is further away from the sun, it's naturally a little bit colder than Jupiter, and so those clouds are going to form lower down. All right, now looking around Saturn, we also see lots of moons. Uh, it turns out that Saturn actually has 82 moons at last count. That puts it higher than Jupiter. Uh, so it is the reigning champion of moons. Now, just like Jupiter, though, most of these are lumpy space potatoes. Asteroids or comets that just got a little bit too close. But like Jupiter, Saturn does also have a few rather large moons that are around it. And the biggest and one of the most interesting of those moons is Titan. Oops, there we go. So Titan here doesn't quite look like much. Uh, and that's big. Part of what makes it so strange, what we're seeing here is actually a thick atmosphere. 
Titan is the only moon in the solar system to have a thick atmosphere. And it's actually thicker than Earth's. It's about one and a half times uh, Earth's atmosphere. And it's so thick and covered in clouds that, like we saw with Venus, we can't see down to the surface. And so it took uh, the Cassini spacecraft and the Huygens space probe to let us peer through those clouds and see what the surface of Titan looks like. And it is eerily familiar. So it is, of course, extremely cold out here. But what we see in a lot of the features on Titan are things that look like, well, flowing liquid. What looks like dried up riverbeds and, and streams and possible ancient lakes. We see a lot of erosion that's very similar to the erosion we see here on Earth. Um, now, the, the unfamiliar of this comes down to what's causing all of this. So, of course, on Earth we have liquid water, but it's too cold for that out here. Uh, any water is frozen. It's solid. Uh, so instead, on Titan, we actually have liquid methane. And the Cassini spacecraft did actually find lakes of liquid methane around the north and south poles of Titan. And so it seems that Titan actually has a full-on precipitation cycle with methane uh, instead of, you know, the water that we think of for a precipitation cycle. And it is the only other world in our solar system besides Earth that has liquid water, or not liquid water, that has liquid on its surface. Uh, so it's a very strange but familiar world and one that we are very interested in studying more. And so there is a uh, spacecraft, um, Dragonfly, that is going to be heading to Titan. Uh, it's actually a little quadcopter because there's an atmosphere you can fly through it. And so this little quadcopter is going to fly around and let us study Titan a little bit more. I'm kind of in line with that. Um, we just got the question, why does Titan have an atmosphere? Um, Good question. Yeah. Um, so whether an object has an atmosphere kind of depends on two things. The size of the object, because that's going to determine how strong the gravity is. But temperature also plays a part because the gases in an atmosphere, um, they move faster when it's hotter and slower when it's colder. And so for Titan, it's got just the right mix of having enough gravity and being cold enough for the world to be able to hold on to those gases and form an atmosphere. So it's kind of just like the, the perfect combo to give it that atmosphere. That was a really good question. Yeah. All right. So our next to last planet, the planet with the funny name, uh, Uranus. Now, I, I know everyone loves making jokes about the name of this planet, um, but I actually have something to tell you. Um, this, isn't always, this hasn't always been the planet's name. When it was first discovered back in, I want to say the 1500s, by astronomer William Herschel, he named it George. Yep, the planet used to be named George, technically Georgium Sidis. Um, so William Herschel is or was an English astronomer, and when he found this new planet, he knew that if he named it after the King of England, who at the time, excuse me, who at the time was King George. Uh, that the king would be really happy. And that is exactly what happened. The king ended up giving him lots of money. He became like part of the royal court. It just, a lot of good things happened. However, other astronomers, particularly those who weren't English and therefore didn't serve King George, hated the fact that there was now a planet named after the King of England. And so there was a lot of debate, a lot of back and forth before they finally agreed to change the name. And they just said, uh, they settled on calling it Uranus because Uranus is one of the Greek gods. And so it fits the trend of the planets being named after Greek and Roman gods. But for the beginnings, it was named George. 
Uh, now, George here looks quite a bit different than Jupiter and Saturn. We see maybe some hints of some stripes there, uh, but not really much. Overall, it seems to be fairly smooth and uniform. It does have this really pretty pale blue-green color to it. And that actually comes from methane in the atmosphere. Methane uh, absorbs red light and reflects blue light. Uh, but another strange thing about it is if we look at kind of how the, the moons are oriented, all of the moons are kind of perpendicular to its orbit. Whereas the other planets we've seen, um, a lot of the moons are kind of parallel to the planet's orbit. And this actually tells us that Uranus itself is knocked over on its side. And we're not 100% sure how that happens, um, but the best hypothesis is it literally got knocked over. Something big hit it, knocked it over on its side, and now the planet just kind of rolls around the solar system on its side. All right, our last planet to go and see is Neptune. Neptune has the beautiful deep blue color to it that, like Uranus, comes from methane. Uh, but we do see a bit more distinct kind of stripes. We also see some higher kind of lighter clouds that sit higher up in the atmosphere. And we also see some storms, kind of like we saw on Jupiter. Um, Neptune does have a larger storm to it. Oops, let me not go quite that fast. There we go. A little bit faster, there we go. Um, the storm is called the Great Dark Spot because it's a great dark spot. Um, and it's, you know, about about the size of the Earth, so still a very large storm. Uh, but what's unusual here is it seems to have disappeared. Uh, so we're not sure if it has actually dissipated and disappeared, uh, or if it's just being covered up by some higher clouds. Uh, but the last few times we've gotten some good looks at Neptune, it seems to have been gone. So there's, there's a little mystery there. Overall, though, there's not a lot that we know about these outer two planets, Uranus and Neptune. Uh, that's because they're so far away that it's just difficult for us to study them from here on Earth. And we've only had one spacecraft fly by them, and that was Voyager 2 in the late 80s. So there's a lot that we don't know and a lot that we still need to try and figure out. It's just difficult to do with the limited knowledge that we have, the limited information that we have. But with that, we, oops, there we go. Ah, controls, nope. There we go, is that gonna work now? There we go, okay. Uh, we have taken a look at the planets in our solar system. Um, and so that's, I think is gonna wrap us up unless we have um, anything else that people want to go see or want to go visit. I think I've covered a few things that were mentioned. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, did we get any other questions in, Eli? Mm -mm. Nope. No. All right. Oh, um, actually. Just right now, yeah. Um, my eight-year-old wants to know about possible life in space. That is a complicated question. Um, so far, we have not found life anywhere other than Earth. Uh, that's actually one of Perseverance's, the new rover on Mars. One of its main missions is to search for evidence of past or current life on Mars. There's a few other places in our solar system that we think it might be likely, um, a few of the moons around the outer planets, um, but we, we just haven't found it yet. Uh, now, to add a little bit of my own personal feelings into this, uh, I think the universe is far too big for there not to be life elsewhere. 
there are hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy. What we have found is about 20% of those have Earth-like planets. And then there are trillions of galaxies in the universe. That is a lot of potential places that life could develop. And I just think that the statistics are, are too skewed. I mean, it, skewed's not the right word. Uh, I think the statistics are in favor of there being lots of other life out there. Uh, now, whether we find it and can communicate with it is, we don't know. Space is really big. Things are really far apart. Uh, so it may just be that we never get to meet or communicate with anyone. But yeah, I, I think it's out there. I think it's out there. Um, we've got a request to see Pluto. Uh, I figured. We normally get a request for Pluto. Um, right. And then another was possible life would be single-celled. Yes. Um, and that is much more likely to find, um, just because it's a lot simpler than like, you know, advanced intelligent life like us. Um, so it does seem a lot more likely that we'll find like single cell life, but as requested, here is little dwarf planet Pluto with a very famous kind of heart on it. Yes, Quinn. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we just got um, my eight-year-old is writing a PowerPoint on space with her second-grade friends. Is there anything you think it would be essential to tell her classmates? Ooh. I don't know. That's kind of. I, I don't know that I can pick. I always think the coolest thing to talk about is just how far away everything is and how yeah. big it all is. Yeah, that's that's usually um, something that shocks a lot of people when they understand just how much space there is in space. Like, for example, the distance between the Earth and the moon, you could fit all of the planets of the solar system in between it and still have a good amount of wiggle room before uh, you were running out of space. And Jupiter is pretty big. Yeah. Um, we just also got, why was Pluto demoted? Um, did we find another planet just past Pluto? Um, so the story with Pluto, and I don't like to say that it got demoted other than reclassified. Mm -hmm. um, Pluto has always been a bit of an oddball. Um, just given it, it's very small. It's actually smaller than our moon. Has a more unusual orbit than the other planets in our solar system. Um, but what really kind of solidified this need for reclassification came in the early 2000s when we started finding lots of other things like Pluto out there. And so the question astronomers had to answer was, do we call all of these things planets and then end up with like 20 planets? Or do we come up with a new category for the Pluto-like objects? And that's what they opted for. And that new category is dwarf planets. Um, I think there's a little bit of indication there in that Pluto is the largest of the dwarf planets. So he is the king of the dwarf planets. Uh, but that's where that kind of reclassification came from. Yeah. And this isn't the first time that's happened. Um, in fact, the asteroids... Um, the first asteroids found, uh, the asteroid series, uh, was first called a planet, and then after a few more asteroids were found, they were called minor planets, and then after even more were found, they became asteroids. So it's not the first time that this has happened, uh, it's just, you know, one that happened in our lifetime. Any other questions? No, that's it. All right, well, um, one last shot. If you do have any last questions for us, leave them down in the comments while we give that a minute or two to see if anything else comes in. Let me tell you what you can expect over the next week. As I mentioned, on Wednesday, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the mysteries of the red planet, Mars, uh, where we'll talk about um, really as much as we can in half an hour uh, leading up to the landing of Perseverance and kind of updates on that mission. 
Um, and just a side note, um, we're kind of experimenting with the idea of turning this into a like new series we do, a kind of exploration series, where you guys tell us what topics you'd like to see a kind of deep dive in, whether it's a, a planet, a moon, black holes, star systems, uh, planets around other stars, uh, any particular object or type of object that you want to know more about, let us know. And uh, we might start this kind of monthly exploration series to, to explore that. Um, and then next Saturday, we are going to be uh, taking a look at how astronomers are able to learn about the universe through light. Because that's just about the only thing we have. Uh, and there's a lot that light can tell us. Other than that, um, your friendly reminder that we are now offering virtual private shows. Uh, so if you'd like to um, book a private show, we've done a few birthday parties, which have been a lot of fun. Uh, we're also offering virtual field trips through this as well. Um, you can find more information about that on our website. And then if you like what we do and want to support us, we are still selling our t-shirts to uh, help us raise money since we have been closed for almost a year now. Um, and I've teased this before, but we do have some new stuff, some, some new, uh, merch coming out soon. Um, that should, I want to say, I want to say within the next month, we'll be able to go live with that. Uh, but very excited for the new stuff coming. All right. Any last questions come in? Uh, nope. Just a suggestion to, uh, look closer at meteor showers when that, uh, monthly. Ooh. That's a good one. We will write that down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, then I guess we will wrap up for the night. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show. Um, we do this uh, every week, Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7 p.m. I know this week was a little unusual with uh, not having a Saturday or not having a Wednesday show, but we'll be back to uh, twice a week shows as normal next week and for the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.